again. That's all right. Um, but we were talking about the Anglican Church and then something else. Well, they call themselves apostolic, but so I guess they're not because they only go back to the, as the church in Canterbury. Correct. But that doesn't keep going back its lineage back to the apostles? Because that church came from the Roman church, right? Well, they cut its right, they cut off from the apostolic church. So if you trace their history, it goes back to the Roman Catholic church, which still exists. And so they split from that. But, then, but now they're not taking their own. Because they don't take their orders from the Pope, and therefore they're not part of the Catholic church? Correct. Because they do not recognize the authority which Jesus Christ established in Peter and his legitimate successors, they split from the one church which Christ set up. And here's the thing. The fact that they actually profess to believe in the Catholic Church, in the Nicene Creed, yeah. a lot of Protestants do, they, by doing that, condemn themselves out of their own mouths. Because <clears throat> if you ask, ask them, like you say the Nicene Creed, right? Right. But you also admit that you're not Catholic. But I want to be. But, you, but do you see the problem? That, that if you're professing that you believe in the Catholic Church, and then when someone asks you, are you Catholic, you say no. Because they won't accept me in the church. Right, but before we get to that, okay. do you see the problem with people who are professing that they believe in, in the Catholic Church as the one true church, but yet, when asked what religion are you part of, are you Catholic? No. I was raised Protestant. Well, do you see how the, that person is actually denouncing himself out of his own mouth? Yeah, he, he's professing to believe that this is the one true church, and then admitting when people ask him that he's not part of that Catholic church, which he regards as the one true church. And so that's just a small example of how ridiculous Protestantism is. I mean, obviously not all Protestants would claim to believe in the Catholic church, but many of them do. And it just shows how, how illogical the whole thing is. But it's really critical to embrace the traditional Catholic faith. It's the only faith. Our website explains how one can come into it. But in order to get the grace to do that, <clears throat> one has to have a strong prayer life, a deeper interest in these issues, and you really need to start praying the rosary. The rosary. Yeah. Not just Hail Mary and Our Father? Well, that's that's good, and that's something that you should do. But the rosary is extremely powerful because... It also involves meditation on the mysteries of the life of Jesus and Mary and um, the aspects of the incarnation, the redemption, etc. Okay. And uh, we can send you a sheet on how to pray it if you're interested in ordering. Or... I am. Um, okay, well, my original question was. Um, oh, yeah. So what am I supposed to say to this Catholic priest? I mean... You know, I've, I've brought this up in conversation with him before. And, you know, he regards me as, you know, just a Protestant who plays the organ for us. But, you know, like they told me when I got there at the church that when he goes to the, I don't remember what it's called, but the place where they keep the bread, the little... Tabernacle? Or whatever. Tabernacle? Yeah. They say that when they, they, they kneel down and pray, well, they don't pray, but they kneel down and bow, basically, before that when he goes and opens it because she told me Catholics believe that that is where the body of Christ stays or the spirit of Christ stays and when he opens it you know to be respectful about that and she told me don't laugh because apparently people in the past had laughed about it and I said I don't understand you're praying to a box she said no we're not praying to a box we're praying to what it symbolizes you know well she doesn't know what she's talking about either um the, the fact is, that, so you're not familiar with the Catholic teaching on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Oh, it's, during the, it's not because he's in the church, it's in the Eucharist. Right, right, it's because the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ when properly consecrated by a valid priest. And so that is Jesus himself. And so it, it is to be worshipped. And that is another example of one of the major Protestant heresies because the fact that Jesus teaches that communion, properly celebrated and validly uh, consecrated, is his body, blood, soul, and divinity, is his true presence, 
That is totally clear from the Bible in John chapter 6. Okay, that's why he, in John 6, 54, he says, unless a man, uh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. Okay, uh, he specifically says, unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. That's just a symbolic statement, right? No, it's a literal statement. Well, we just thought to do this in remembrance of me, man. No, uh, right, but a, but Hebrew and Greek scholars point out that the word he uses there, okay, can mean make making happen again. Okay, so that like when people, when a priest says the Mass, that he is actually reenacting, he's representing the sacrifice. There's one sacrifice which Christ offered on the cross for the redemption of the world, but when a priest properly celebrates the sacrifice of the Mass, he's actually representing that one offering. And there are other examples of that in the epistles of Paul, talking about, you know, this as a sacrifice. But the fact of the matter, that's why he says, this is my body, this is my blood. Yeah. And, and he could have said, this is a symbol. But he did, didn't he? Did he? No. He I've said, heard it said symbolic before. No, he says, this is my body. And that's why St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 says that when we partake in the cup of Christ, it's partaking in the blood of Christ. Okay? And that's why the earliest Christians all believed in the real presence of the Eucharist. It's totally obvious from the early church fathers, like St. Ignatius of Antioch. You ever heard of him? Uh, it was mentioned on the tape. Yeah, these are the earliest writers of the Christian church, the earliest bishops, the earliest... Antioch was where it was founded, right? Well, no, that was one of the early centers of Christianity. Right. That was where the Acts of the Apostles says that the name Christians was first used. It's also, ironically, or interestingly, the place where the word Catholic was first recorded. So okay. both Catholic and Christian are first used in Antioch, or with regard to Antioch. But St. Ignatius of Antioch um, was the third bishop of Antioch. Okay. He, he lived... Uh, around the turn of the first century. So he wrote like in 110 and 107 in that era. Okay. And uh, he, he used the term Catholic Church. He spoke of the Church as having a hierarchy uh, under which people must operate, that there are bishops in the Church, that you must be under the bishops. And he spoke clearly about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And he talked about heretics who do not recognize the Eucharist as the actual flesh, the body and blood of Christ. Oh, so this was an issue that was a big thing back then? They covered and well, it was, got over and, then, you know, just well, going on. Just, well, well, the earliest Christians believed it, but the heretics didn't. And so, heretics, you mean what? People who were outside of the hierarch hierarchical structure of the Church, the one body which continued down through the ages, and rejected the clear teaching, but Here's the thing. Almost all Protestant scholars and even Anglican scholars who have regard for the early church would re that's the word. It wasn't apostolic he was saying, he was saying it was Anglican. Which means what? Uh, it re refers to the Church of England. Oh, okay. And and because King Henry the Eighth proclaimed himself supreme head of the Church of England. He just said, hey, all of a sudden I'm the, ch I'm the, I'm the guy? Yeah, basically that the Pope can't tell me or, you know, he doesn't can't intrude in my jurisdiction over ecclesiastical affairs in England. Then he killed all the Catholics, didn't he? Well, he killed he, he, some of them. Oh, okay. So the Episcopal Church is not even a valid church at all, is what you're saying? No, none of them are. What I'm saying is there's only one church. The Catholic Church. So right. You say that there's different sects of the Catholic Church. No, there's only one. What I'm saying is there are lots of people who claim to be Catholic who are not, but there's only one church, and what that church teaches has a definite uh, set of beliefs which anyone can ascertain, anyone can find out by examining the traditional teachings of the popes and so forth. So is it, is it going to be necessary to read the other readings, not from the Bible, but the other books of old, to understand this all? No. This is all just from the Bible. Well, the Bible is one source of revelation. That's why you have to understand it's another major Protestant error and heresy. Okay. Is that they teach that Scripture alone is the only source of revelation. Have you heard that? 
to um, the, the Bible is the only necessary thing that you need to be saved. Yeah, it's, it's basically the only rule of faith for Christians, they true. say. Yeah. That's not true. The Bible and that's all. That's not true. Do you need the other teachings as well? No, you need the tradition. <clears throat> okay, and the church. There, there are two sources of Jesus Christ's revelation. There's what was written down in the Word of God in the Bible, okay? But there's also what was revealed to the apostles through the spoken tradition. And that that must be accepted as well. And that's proven by the fact that the Bible itself teaches that you must hear or heed the spoken tradition. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, it talks about where St. Paul says that accept not only those traditions which you have learned by epistle, but also those which you have learned or heard by word. Okay? So that there are, there are traditions of Christ which must be accepted, which are not just written down, but also delivered by word of mouth. Well, meaning from the church? Well, well, they were delivered by the apostles and, and maintained in the church and expressed often by the early church fathers, but the way you know for certain whether something is part of the authentic tradition is the teaching authority of the church that he set up under Peter. And that's clear from Matthew eighteen seventeen and elsewhere, where he says that if any man, if there's a dispute, you know, uh, bring it to the church, and if any man refuses okay. to hear the church, let him be as the heathen and the publican. I, I remember that. But what about, okay, now jumping ahead to the, the current pope of the church, you say that basically he's not for the church, more or less, since he's trying to tear it down, isn't he? Yeah, well, and we'll, we say something even more specific, that according to the teaching of the popes themselves, that if you faithfully apply the teaching of the past popes, this man cannot be a valid pope. He's the, not even a correct pope? He's not a valid pope. Valid. He's an anti-pope. He's a false claimant. So who put him in charge? Well, church did, right? He was recognized by the cardinals in Rome, but that doesn't mean that he's necessarily a valid pope, because according to the popes teaching themselves, if he's a heretic before his election, the election is invalid. So according to the teaching of the past popes, this man is not a valid pope. So what do we have? A popeless church? Right. Just like when the pope dies. There is no Pope. The chair of Peter is considered vacant. So you're saying there's basically no direct servant of God on earth? No. Is that not what the Pope does? He leads the church. His jo job is to rule the church and safeguard Catholic teaching and govern the flock. Is but the same as the high priest in the Old Testament? Well, it's, it's definitely, yes. The high priest in the Old Testament was, on a certain level, a foreshadowing of what the Pope is. It's not exactly the same, okay? But the rituals are all different, right? But like a leader, okay, with authority and so forth. But here's the thing: not even a true pope. Do you understand what the church teaches about a pope and papal infallibility and all that? No. All right. I've well, never. See, that's what my problem is. Well, that's one of my problems with it that I've had all throughout my life is that. You know, my mother and my grandmother, they always say, you don't need to pray to someone to confess to God for you. You can pray directly to God to confess your sins. You don't need to pray through an organization. God hears you. Yeah, well, that's bibli not biblical, because it's refuted by the fact that in John twenty twenty three, Jesus gives the apostles the power to forgive sins. Pray he through me. He said, what's that? This is when he says, pray through me. Now he says, he breathes on the apostles, and he says, Whosoever sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. This is Acts, right? No, this is John twenty twenty three, oh. Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 23, 22, depending on what version. Oh, this is when he came back? Right, after his resurrection. Spirit? After his resurrection, that's right. Okay, this is when the Spirit of Christ came out. This is when I mean, Jesus himself came. Sorry, what? After Jesus himself rose again, okay, he met with the apostles, yeah. and he breathed on them. The Holy Spirit. Right, and he says, Who, whosoever sin, he says, receive the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Whosoever sins you shall not forgive, they are not forgiven. 
and whatever you bind on earth. Well, that was said in two other places, Matthew 18, 18 and John. Matthew 16. No, it wasn't said in John. Um, but that proves that God intended for men to hear confessions of sins. If he didn't, it would be utterly pointless for him to give the apostles the power to forgive sins. It's obvious, it's totally obvious, that he's intending them to hear confessions of those sins. And that's why, like, Protestants have no explanation for that verse whatsoever. Uh, also in... They normally use the Gospel of John more than any Gospel. Well, that, that, you can prove all the major Catholic points just from that Gospel. Protestants frequently reject the necessity of baptism. Like, do you believe that any man can be saved without baptism? No. No man. Like an infant. Okay. Well, it also needs to be a free will choice. I mean, this can't be baptized at birth. Yeah, you can. You Why? you must. Well, because Jesus, because you all people except for the Virgin Mary are conceived in a state of original sin. We're condemned to die because of sin, even when we're very born. Yeah, it says that in Romans, doesn't it? Well, it teaches yeah the concept of original sin, and Jesus makes it clear that unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In John three five, so all men must be born again of water and the Holy Ghost. And whole households were baptized, as we see in the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah and, okay. and from the earliest ages, you know, infant baptism was practiced because infants had original sin, and they can have salvation too, but the only way they can have it is if they're incorporated into Christ through baptism. So free will is not necessary to do God's For an adult. For an adult? Yes. For someone who's of the age of reason. Which is what, five? It depends on the person. I mean, a lot of people say seven, but obviously people can reach the age of reason before seven. Okay. I mean, it, it, it depends. That's something we can't know for sure. But So that's why the Catholic religion just takes care of it early on and make sure that they're part of the No, that's, b- that's because that's the, the truth that Christ delivered, that you must baptize infants, okay, who are of parents who are of the true faith, okay, because they cannot be saved without it. They will they will not get to heaven if they die in infancy without baptism. They will go to a part of hell where there is no fire. They'll be excluded from from all eternity for all eternity from heaven. So like as if they never existed or died? No, they will exist, but they they will not be saved. But they won't be tormented? They will not be tormented with the fires of hell, no. But they will be this is confirmed Catholic teaching. They will they will be among, okay, those who are in hell, but they will not have the the, the fires of hell. Well, that's good to know. They will suffer the punishment of the condemned, exclusive of the punishment of fire. That's the uh, wording of Pius VI. Okay, well, Bull. I've asked these kinds of questions to people in my family and my church, and they just don't talk about it. They go, well, you know, I think that. Um, well, that's interesting. You know, I've never had anybody specifically say. The answer to this, you speak as though you directly know because you actually have read specific teachings on all these little things that I have questions about, right? Yeah. But where do they come from? The old Pope? Well, which particular teaching are you asking about? Baptism, or the infant baptism part. It comes from lots of Popes. It comes from the Council of Florence, Pope Eugene the Fourth. You could quote way back, Council of Carthage, Pope Zosimus, way back in the early church, okay, come Pope Innocent, uh, Way back in the in the early church, he says it's idiotic to assert that any infant can be saved without baptism. Council of Trent, perhaps the most famous council in all of church history, anathematized, excommunicated anyone who would assert that infants can be saved without baptism. They would kick them out of the church forever? Yeah, if you do not accept that teaching, that infants cannot be saved without baptism, or anybody, that person is not a Catholic. He's automatically excommunicated. Like a really hard organization to get into, or very easy, well, that, it's very easy to lose. Well, that's what even the same today as it was back then. That, well, where does that come from? It comes from Jesus Himself. That if you don't accept what Jesus has taught, that's why He says in Matthew twenty-eight that preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and that if they don't hear the church, there is the heathen. There's one rule. There's one line. It's God's revelation. You either accept it or you don't. If you don't accept it, you're not part of God's church. That's how simple it is. You can't pick and choose. That's where the word heresy 
or heretic comes from, the idea of choosing, refusing to submit to what God has revealed, but choosing to accept what is more, you know, likable or something that you prefer. Hold on a sec. Is there anything more excellent than prayer, asks St. Augustine? Is there anything more beneficial in our life? Anything sweeter to the heart or anything more sublime in our holy religion? So, that's, um, it's really simple, though. I mean, it's something where you would agree that if God has revealed something, you can't just say, well, I don't really like that one, or I don't think that that makes sense. Yeah. No, and it also says in the New Testament, I don't remember where, but it says something about, you know, if you learn the truth and then you refuse to act against them or just ignore them anyway, your punishment's twice as bad. Hebrews talks about yeah, the, talking to the Jews about that, right? Well, it's actually talking about if, if you're referring to the passage which I, I'm thinking you're referring to in Hebrews um, it talks about that those who have once received the heavenly gift and have tasted the good word of God but then have fallen away okay, it is impossible for them to be renewed on dependence, crucifying to themselves the son of man, making him a mockery that basically that those who have received the graces of baptism in the church but then basically spurn them and commit mortal sins and then they can never receive the, the born again graces that come with baptism okay they can be forgiven in confession but the graces conferred by baptism are unique because they remit all punishment due to sin all original and actual sin you can't have a second baptism so that's what it's saying, but and it's also illustrate that also totally blows away this idea of justification by faith alone, which we have a whole tape refuting that myth. That the, wasn't righteousness credited to Abraham by faith alone? No, <laughs> no. In fact, James says that it, Abraham was justified by works. Book, book, book of Je- what would happen happen uh, for offering oh, up the offer uh, Isaac. Up a, yeah, he. Uh, but it wasn't just. But it says his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Right, because faith is important. But faith, faith must also be combined with obedience. Right. Faith without... And we, that's, why we ha- that's why we have that whole audio tape, Justification by Faith Alone Refuted, on our website. You'd also get it with this package. It goes through all the passages in the Gospel, which totally blow this whole idea away. It's one of the biggest lies of all time. What? Justification by Faith Alone. That you if I believe in Christ, that'll be enough? Yeah. It's a total lie. Is that somewhere in the Bible? Does it say what? Doesn't it say that if all who believe in me will be saved? Right, but in every context of that, that presupposes obedience and faithfulness and freedom from grave sin. Does it, you mean that's the part that they're talking about when they say, Lord, all those who call upon the Lord will not be saved? Matthew 7. I don't know you. Matthew seven twenty one Does and following. Does it mean I don't know you because you didn't do what I wanted you to do? Or is it because you didn't right. do my will? Or what is it yeah, mean? exactly. What did you say? Be- that? Well, it, that people who call him Lord, who think that he is their Lord, but they're not of his true faith and or don't obey him, don't follow after his teachings and laws and commandments, all of them? That, that he doesn't know them. You have to follow every single little thing. You have to accept all the dogmas of the church. You have to belong to the church. You have to be baptized, and you have to stay free of mortal sin. But do you have to be baptized of that church? No, you have to be validly baptized. Um, well, I was baptized. I am baptized. I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That Jesus is my personal Savior in the remission of my sins. In, in what church? Uh, my church, my old church. What was that? Day Spring, uh, Day Spring Church of Christ. When were, well, as an infant or? National church, really. Well, it, it might have been valid, but you you still have to convert. You still have to you know, make a profession of faith and confession, and the prof- the profession of faith includes like an abjuration of heresy, and so. Okay, I got another problem here. You said that after you're baptized, you don't get the grace of baptism and commit mortal sins afterwards. Um, I was more... Okay, I got baptized at like 13 or 14. Um, but it was definitely when I turned 18 that most of my worst things started. In fact, I've committed many mortal sins from 18 to 25. Many. It's only been um, maybe 8 to 10 months that I've been turning around and stopped. Most of them. It. And it's been a big decline from what I was. But 
I mean, I'm still not free of all of them. I still can't get out of these routine things that I always do. Well, not always, but do a lot. You know, I've, I've quit almost every single thing in my life except my very first thing, you know. Um, but you're saying that you don't get the grace from the original grace from baptism? So what, what are you saying? What I'm saying is that... Now? Without, no, what? what I'm saying is baptism is, is a unique sacrament because it forgives all original and actual sin and the punishment due to sin. So that a person... Well, that would be at age 14, I was well, at that point you were involved in basically a heretical sect and also there were questions about the validity of the baptism itself. That's a little well, bit of a... Now. That's a more involved issue about like per, a person who was... Uh, didn't receive the grace of baptism, but received a valid baptism. That we could get into that, but the, what you need to focus on is converting to the true faith, and you can be come out of the state of sin you're you are in, but you would have to convert, make a full confession, break from mortal sin. Okay, see, like we talk to people a lot, and mm, the most commonly committed sins are sins of the flesh. You know, because that's the one that. Like that's the one that most people go to hell for. That's right. See why? And um, you know, like looking at pornography, that's a common problem. It's mortal sin. It's a horrible thing. Well, luckily I'm free of that type of stuff specifically, but I do have a girlfriend who loves me about quite a bit. What religion is she? She's Japanese. Well, yeah, I'm asking what religion she is. She's trying to become Christian. I just well, but born and raised. Buddhist, but she attended a Catholic school when she was in Japan. Now, you were married before. Yeah. Now, what religion was the person you were married to? None. Pagan. <laughs> she was a drug dealer. I thought I could save her. I thought I could show her a better life and save her from... Was she married life. before? No. Hmm. I thought I could save her, and then uh, she left me for another... Well, she picked another man. I caught him in bed. And then we divorced because of that. And uh, now currently she has, like, she has one baby, maybe another one. And I don't ever talk to her anymore. And I haven't really talked to her except a few times after that. And I have no desire to go back to her because of... Well, there was another man sleeping in my bed. Even though that, that man is a, a fairly okay friend of mine now, which is kind of strange since I, I sent him to the emergency room that night. But it's, it's something like... In fact, he was in rehab with me. Um, I, it's a very complex thing. But, you know, to love your enemy is more important than to love your friend. Well, but before... I'm a very good friend because he was my enemy. Well, what you need to focus on is <clears throat> making sure that you're on the right path. But it's hard to get rid of this girl when she stands to gain so much by being with me. I know that sounds vain and arrogant, but... She never would have ever gone to the Episcopal Church. She goes with me to the Catholic Church, too, but can't understand him because he has a weird accent. But she would never understand any of the teachings at all of Christ if well, she never went to the Episcopal Church. It doesn't matter, though. If they, don't, if they don't become a true member of the Church of Christ and do what they have to do, the fact that they show up at an Episcopal Church is not going to save them. Hold on. Prayer transforms hearts of flesh into spiritual hearts, tepid hearts into zealous hearts. Human hearts into divine hearts, says St. John Chrysostom. With what reverence, then, should we converse with God? Is there anything more excellent than prayer, asks St. Augustine? Is there anything more beneficial in our life, anything sweeter to the heart, or anything more sublime in our holy religion? Prayer is the groundwork of all virtues, the ladder by which we mount to God. It is related to the angels. It is the foundation of faith. Of all things that we esteem and treasure in this life, there is nothing more precious than prayer, says St. Gregory. And St. Ephraim exclaims, Oh, the magnificent and sublimity of prayer. Happy he who prays zealously. Satan cannot... Okay. Um, so... Your time? What's that? Do you need to be doing something different? Well, yeah, but like I said, you you need to act upon this. I'm not sure you see the total need to, to do that. You, just, you should start praying the rosary. I would recommend this package. I don't know if you're interested in getting it.
Well, I am. Did you want to order it now or not? I don't have a credit card. Okay. I could send a cashier's check. Yeah, it's ten bucks. Yeah. If if you send us ten dollars, do you have our address? Um, no. Do you have any of our videos or DVDs handy? Yeah. Does it have the cover? Yeah, it has the address on the back. Yeah, it should have the full address, website, four, four, two, five, everything. Four two five Schneider Road. Yep. If you sent ten dollars and asked for the DVD special. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then just work from it from there. Oh, and also, one other thing you should ask for is a rosary and a how to pray the rosary sheet, if you do it. Would you do it? I have a rosary from the Catholic Church. Oh, you do? Well, then ask for a how to pray the rosary sheet. I don't... It has the book on the fall on it. The rosary? Yeah. All right, well, you, then you need a new one. Tell me something. Is this, is this like a... Um, you remember I'm raised Protestant. Is, what is a rosary actually? Is it, it's just symbolic, isn't it? It's not like as if it's a mythical. Um, it's a sacramental. It's 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 an object which basically serves an important role. Hold on, hold on. Spiritual and holy. Great is the efficacy of prayer, for it appeases. In um, devotional or spiritual, it's like holy water. Okay something that's blessed and that that is therefore um, holy for that reason. So rosaries are blessed? They should be, but it's not absolutely necessary. Oh, okay. So I wouldn't worry about that. It's just, you know, the icon thing of the church, you know, it, it seems almost like the old, to me, given where I was raised, it seems to me almost like the Old Testament of the idol. You know what I'm saying? Well, the, the Old Testament utilized images of of uh, angels, okay, surrounding the tabernacle. They had all kinds of strange things, like the horns of the altar. Yeah, so what, what the prohibitions against that were worshipping them. You cannot worship them. And see, like the Protestants who use that, totally lift that out of context. It's awful. It's not. It's not anathematizing all use of images. It's what does an, anathematizing mean? Uh, it comes from the Book of Deuteronomy, basically to excommunicate, to totally reject, to abominate, to actually to treat as dung. That's basically a. Uh, like where it comes from in the Bible, but it's it basically signifies a total rejection, total excommunication. Let's see. Okay, my grandmother before she ever got Alzheimer's and went crazy. She said when she found out I was work, working for the Catholic Church, she said, "Well, whatever you do, don't convert." She also believed. Now, this is a lady that believed if you are not Church of Christ, you're going to hell. And my mom says, "Now, what do you think about when I say?" I'm talking about the holy water and such. She says, well, what do you think about that? You know, so it's me think really deep. Now, do you think that water can be blessed by someone and has some sort of supernatural power? This is what she tells me. So this is what I'm dealing with. I'm like, well, no. She says, well, what do you think about praying to a priest? Do you think you need to pray to a priest to have God hear you? And I say, well, I think God hears me if I pray to God. That's a strange way of putting it, praying to a priest. It's talking about confessing to a priest. That's different. And also, in the Old Testament... Pray. In the book of Leviticus, that when people would sin, they'd have to offer, like, sacrifices, and then they'd have to go to the priest. They'd have to go to the priest. They couldn't just do it on their own. So she needs to uh, wake up. Well, how am I supposed to tell my mom that? You just speak the words. You say that what you're saying is completely unbiblical. Priests were used throughout the Old Testament. People frequently had to go to the priest to be reconciled in the Old Testament. God gave the apostles the power to forgive sins in John 20. Obviously, that means he intended the, these men to hear confessions of sins. And also, but, I mean, you should just... With anyone like that, though, the first thing you would start with is the papacy. We have this audio on our website about the Bible teaches that Jesus made St. Peter the first pope, and we're going to have it on audio tape, hopefully in a week or two. But th if they won't accept that, then forget it. Because that, that's the key. If they won't accept the authority that Christ set up in Peter, they're, they're outside the church. And so these other points don't really matter until they accept that. That's, 
that's so obvious, so clear that he made St. Peter the first pope, gave him charge over his flock, that anyone who would deny that oh, is... Oh, yeah, that was when he reinstated him, right? Well, yeah, I mean, there are numerous passages which prove it. Okay. Matthew 16, John 21, 15 to 17, uh, many others, the Acts of the Apostles, etc., Luke 22. So I would check that out. I would encourage you to send that special in. Those audios on our website prove that Protestantism is not biblical. Anglicanism is utterly ridiculous. It might be the most illogical of all the Protestant sects. I mean, they're all obviously totally illogical and should be rejected. But, I mean, to trace your history to a guy who simply split from the Catholic Church because he wanted a divorce, I mean, that's about as dumb as it gets. I mean, when you really delve into, like, the blow-by-blow account of what he did when he left, when he split, it's yeah, it just hits you as how outrageous it is for anyone to be an Anglican or an Episcopalian. So, is this in your tape? We discuss it on some of our radio programs, our archive radio programs, which are on the website. They're also on this MP3 disc, which you would get with this order. So, like, when you get this MP3 disc, if you have a computer that would play, it probably do. You just put it in your computer, click on my computer or whatever, and it will give you the option. So we discussed that, um, but yeah, I would I would listen to those materials. I would ask for how to pray the rosary. I would start to do that, and then when you're ready to convert, which you need to act upon, you need to do it because unless you do it, you won't make it. I'm just saying, telling you in charity, and you, you can't, but and you also you have to break from committing sin with this woman. I knew I had to do that before I came back, but it was different when I was actually here. Well, it's something where that's the thing which most people fail in. That most people are, are are falling into hell through sins of the flesh, whereas if they could discard those, they would move forward with the what God wants them to do. Not always, but more more likely they, they would be to do that. So, And the devil's really making a push in that area to try to get, get most people in that area. So... Okay. Well, I would I would order that. I suggest I'm supposed to um, make her leave. What's that? How am I supposed to make her leave? Just forget about her altogether? No, you just explain to her that I cannot, you know, do this. I mean, I could 